The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the, the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. How you doing, friends? Back here at Sociology Central. Central uh, what I just read for you are the opening two sentences from Edward Bernays' uh, book, Propaganda. Uh, published, by the way, in 1928, so almost 100 years ago. Um, let me read that sentence, those two sentences again. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. I mean, it's pretty stunning, right? Um, so I would... Um, I was asked several years ago to teach a course on writing or rhetoric or something. I had no idea what it was, so I just I made the course up, and I'm sure I got in trouble for it. Um, and this is one of the books I decided to use because I thought young people in our society should know about how propaganda works. I mean, we always talk about propaganda, and we always think it's the other guy, right? The other guy. He's susceptible to propaganda, but not me. Well, let me just read a few passages from this this amazing. No, Edward Bernays. If you don't know, I should. And before I read these passages, was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he was the first person to use psychological theory in marketing products, but also in marketing politicians. And and he thought that the most important uh, role that propaganda, and he, he later, later changed that to uh, public relations, after the Nazis did a whole bit on, you know, made propaganda a bad word. And you can watch about watch this in a, a, a docu-series by Adam Curtis called Century of the self Revealed, which I think is from almost 20 years ago, if not more. Um, it's worth watching, and you can find it free on the internet for sure. Uh, but let me read a few passages from here just so you can see what I'm talking about. Because it's kind of stunning. Here's, a, here's one. This is the next page. In theory, every citizen makes up his mind on public questions and matters of private conduct. In practice, if all men had to study for themselves the abstruse economic, political, and ethical data involved in every question, they would find it impossible to come to a conclusion without anything. Right? We have voluntarily agreed to let an invisible government sift the data and high spot the outstanding issue so that our field of choice shall be narrowed to practical proportions. Right? Right? And he says, you know, a little bit later, he says, to achieve this, society has consented to permit free competition to be organized by leadership and propaganda. Um, and when I, so when I use this book for for a course, I mean, the students were blown away because they, they were actually, I think I first did this probably 2022, maybe 20, maybe early in 2021. And they were, they were saying, Professor Martin, this is exactly what's happening right now. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. Uh, and it's been going on for a long time. This is the engineering of consent. Um, and this is 1928. Now think about 1928. What was available to us in 1928? as far as media goes. Newspapers, magazines, billboards. Um, people, the movies just started, you know, they were still silent. The, the radio was very young. So, but th those were, were things, now it was long before the internet, right? Which the internet, I think, uh, became a term, enormous tool for the engineering of consent. And we see that all the time. And we see that we saw that especially as uh, people's opinions, which turned out to be right, were 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 squelched in the interest of being safe, but that, which is also propaganda. So it's kind of, it's kind of stunning when you think about what we let ourselves be submitted to. Uh, 
Let me find another couple of choice quotes. Here's a good one. Now, a lot of people think literacy is a good thing, and you would think that an English professor would think literacy is a good thing. Well, here's the thing, boys and girls. Um, I mean, just put it this way. Um, it's a two-edged sword, right? Um, I the, And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but probably the most susceptible group to certain kinds of propaganda are is, is actually the professoriate. I've seen, I mean, I was, I've been in academia, or I was in academia for 25 years, and God, I hate it for a reason. And the reason I hate it is because I have, I saw far less critical thinking in academia, uh, in, you know, institutions that pride themselves on critical thinking than I have seen in the working class people, you know, you know out here in the country where I live. So one of my friends is a logger, another, you know, mechanics, uh, farm, a lot of farmers I know, they all have much better, uh, much more common sense and much uh, more useful critical thinking skills than just about any professor I've met, very with very few exceptions in, in the professoriate. I hate to say it, but it's true. So let me, actually, I'm going to read this uh, little snippet for you. This just <laughs> flew by me on social media, actually from a school where I teach, in fact, where I taught that course. Um. And this was posted on the wall, like in the hallway or whatever. There's probably a bunch of them. I'm going to read this. This will, this will blow your mind. Adrian College in, in Adrian, Michigan. Critical thinking is defined as a set of strategies by which students explicitly employ the principles and standards of thinking and intentionally use these principles and strategies in assessing and improving the quality and depth of their thinking. Okay, that's so far so good. But here's the next part. This is where this is the kicker. Uh, the improving the quality and depth of their thinking with within the context of sociology, criminal justice, and human services, uh, to which we, any rational person can only respond, "What the absolute fuck?" Uh, so yeah, so there's no critical thinking going on in college campuses, and, and if you follow me on social media or even in I think on, on my sub stack on the Druid Stairs back, um, I often comment about that, that, you know, after 25 years of critical thinking as an institutional learning objective, I haven't seen any yet. Um, and, and there it is, right? So what it's, and it's, again, this is the engineering of consent. And later in this book, actually, let's see if I can find it. Here's, here's what he says about, he has a whole chapter on education. Let's right, start right there. Propaganda for education. <clears throat> and one of the things he says, the normal school should provide for the training of the educator to make him realize that his is a twofold job. Education is a teacher and education is a propagandist. And we've seen this over and over in the last um, few years, right? I mean, with the, you see, you probably see it almost. I haven't seen it as as often as I was, but there were all, all these uh, school board meetings where parents would come complaining that the the library or classes are actually teaching children how you know about oral sex or gender gender choice or whatever, right? Little kids too. I mean, in fact, actually, my my a very good friend of mine um, had. Uh, the, 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 the couple had their children who were young, like kindergarten or pre-K in a Waldorf school in Michigan. <clears throat> and they had those kinds of books in, in a Waldorf school, which is shocking because Waldorf used to be the, like the place people would send their kids to protect their childhood. And they had a meeting with the teacher and said, this, this stuff keeps going. We're taking the kids out. And it did keep going. And they took the kids out and to their great credit. Um, because the teacher and teachers' colleges are just, they're just propaganda farms. You know, pro education programs are, are propaganda farms. And people, here's the thing though the brilliance of the way they do the propaganda is 
Um, they make you think. They make you think it's your idea, right? So that's part part of the the way the, the consent is engineered, and the way it happens in higher education is those those who go along get along, and <clears throat> and so people who who buck against that system, me, um, <laughs> meet with a lot of resistance, which I have. In my career, which is why I got out. I can't stand. I can't stand being a, an accomplice to a crime anymore. And not that I was ever an accomplice to the to these kinds of crimes. I was actually, you know, like John the Baptist. I was a, a voice crying in the wilderness, <laughs> you know, about the real need for critical thinking. Um, which is why I brought this book into to the classroom. <clears throat> and here, here goes the second reason. The second reason for the present remoteness of education from the thoughts and interests of the public is found in the mental attitude of the pedagogue, whether primary school teacher or college professor toward the world outside the school. All right, this is a difficult psychological problem. The teacher finds himself in a world in which the emphasis put on those objective goals and those objective attainments are prized by our American society. So when he was writing, right, the engineer of consent was more, um, you know, kind of uh, the classic 1930s and 40s version of, you know, kind of America first, or, you know what I mean? The, the saving democracy was actually, was, was saving democracy was actually a, a phrase invented by Edward Bernays to, uh, to promote the aims of the, what we can call the, the Anglo-American Empire, right? So those kinds of things, and those are the kinds of things that's kind of funny that the hippies were fighting against in the 60s, right? But unfortunately, so many of those hippies became the Barack Obamas and John Kerry's, who are even more down with the, the project to engineer consent than, than their, their forebears in, in the 50s and 60s. So yeah, so we're up we're up against the people. Um, let me find some more choice quotes here. There's all kinds of them. Well, here's what he says, right? Uh, I was just talking about war propaganda. It was, of course, the astounding success of propaganda during the war that opened the eyes of the intelligent few in all the departments of life to the possibilities of regimenting the public mind. Right. The American government and numerous patriotic agencies developed a technique which, to most persons accustomed to bidding for public acceptance, was new. They not only appealed to the individual by means of every approach, visual, graphic, and auditory, to support the national endeavor, but they also secured the cooperation of the key men in every group. Persons whose mere word carried authority to hundreds of thousands or hundreds of hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers. I mean, talk about, yeah, right. This is, uh, I mean, the, the flood of propaganda we have on social media these days. It's just my, especially right now in, in the last weeks of a presidential campaign, it's insane. But I think, you know, when I, when I think about when he wrote this and a movie that came out right after this, I think 1932 was the Marx Brothers Duck Soup. Which, if you know the movie, is a it's a it's a send up of the War Machine. It's a send up of BlackRock. <laughs> if it were to be up put to put out today, of course they never get the funding to put it out today. But they actually did it back in the 1930s. And there's this really funny scene, like a big production number, where they're we're going to war, we're going to war, we're going to war, right? Just like you see in the propaganda machine. And one of the things they do, they come up with banjos and it's like a singing a, a Negro spiritual. They got guns. We got guns. All God's children got guns. We're going to walk all over the battlefield because all God's children got guns. <laughs> it's too funny. They're the best. Um, but they, they actually, they probably couldn't make that now. They would actually, they, if they, the Marx Brothers made that now, they would not go through a studio. They'd have to do it independently on Twitter or X. Um, that's the only place you can criticize the war machine. And I, you know, I mean, it's a weird thing, you know, um, speaking of propaganda, 
So when my wife and I were married 32 years ago, um, we were skeptical of vaccines. We were into organic food. We wanted a big family, um, which we have. Um, what else? And we voted Democrat. Um, and we were anti-war. I mean, we were the big thing. We were anti-war, right? Um, but it's weird that in the ensuing 32 years, it's like, the, you know, the, the Democrats who used to be the power, power party of peace, at least that was their that was their propaganda, are certainly the prop the party of war right now. I mean, there's certainly a lot of Republicans who are also part of the party of war, and they're all neocons, right? So I think it's interesting if you think about it, this uh, current, uh, what do they call it, um, cooperation that's on uh, between Robert F. Kennedy people and health people and the Trump campaign is an interesting development because I think it, it, it could, we could only pray, destroy both the Democratic and Republican parties, which would be a blessing. Um, but who knows, you know, <laughs> The, the invisible hand uh, does not like that. So, and they have a lot of power. So we'll see what, what happens. And they also have, they have the media. They have the propaganda wing. But it's interesting, right? Also, <clears throat> and you, tell me if you, if you agree or disagree in the comments about any of this stuff, that uh, It even seems like the, you know the leg legacy media they call it has lost its it, much of its pull, and in fact the leg legacy media truck you know they probably get more views on Twitter or on X than they do on their actual broadcasts. Um, but you know I think we've seen people you know, are a great move toward distrusting them as propaganda agents, right? Anyway, actually if if you saw. Um, the recent, there were some hearings in Washington about health and about f the food industry and about the differences between like uh, the American version of, I don't know, these, these cereals, some kind of kid cereal, like Twix, is that this? No, it's whatever it's called. Um, or it's the Captain Crunch, for instance, and compare the ingredients on there to the, the Captain Crunch that they sell in Europe or Canada where they have stricter rules about what children can eat. And in the American versions, they have all these dyes and other kinds of chemicals, many of which are carcinogens or attack neurodevelopment. And it's just sick, <laughs> it's literally sick. It makes people sick. But we're, you know, um, that propaganda starts early, right? And children's, the commercials, they market to children, whether it's for Barbie, you know, what what is Barbie selling us? Um, or, you know, breakfast cereals or whatever. But Barbie is an interesting story. You might appreciate this story. So when I was a Waldorf teacher, um, we were going on a field trip. And I had, in my car, I had four or five girls from my class. And, and we're just driving a couple miles, I think it was to the Detroit Opera Theater or something. And they were probably fifth or sixth graders. And I remember saying to the girls, I said, girls, uh, do your parents let you play with Barbie? And all of the girls said yes, except for one girl whose mother happened to be a weightlifter and a Detroit cop. And I said, she said, my mama doesn't let me play with it. I said, well, why not? Because my mama said she got all that, all that clothes and all that money, but she ain't got no job. <laughs> so so the, the propaganda didn't work on that family. And, and and props to them, right? And here, speaking of food, here's, I just happened to bump into this propaganda, a uh, piece, piece from propaganda. Millions of housewives may feel that manufactured foods deleterious to health should be prohibited, right? 1928. But there is little, little chance that their individual desires will be translated into effective legal form unless their half expressed demand can be organized, made vocal, and concentrated upon the state legislature or upon the federal Congress in some mode which will produce the results they, they desire. Whether they realize it or not, they call upon propaganda to organize and effectuate their demand. Now, that's not propaganda. That's rhetoric. 
That's the that's the power of argument, right? Uh, propaganda, at least the way I interpret it, and I think we all let's, let's come down to this, is not. Uh, it's using the, t the tools of persuasion to gain power, not to not like poetry to inform and delight, right? Not to spread uh, or spread awareness, um, but it, it's to, propaganda is used as a tool of power, right? That's why it's different than rhetoric or our persuasion. And. And he's trying to make sugar coated. Well, yeah, everybody does it. It's propaganda. It's not propaganda. It's rhetoric. Um, and I think we saw that in that, that hearing in Washington. They were, they weren't. It wasn't propaganda. They're telling you actual facts, right? And and the real propaganda is in the 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 levers of power that operate, you know, through lobbying or other kinds of things that that make that stuff legal in this country. And it. And those poisons are not legal in, in foods across the world, only in the United States, which is why, what was it, 40% are, of Americans are obese and 75% are overweight? Good God. Um, let me see, is there anything else we should talk about? Well, you know, the thing is, if you go through this book, and it's interesting to me, because um, I have been interested in this idea of, you know, propaganda, but also uh, brainwashing, we can call it, or how do people get persuaded to do things that are against their own interests for a long time. <clears throat> and I've been thinking about it, and I think uh, my son and I were just talking last night about Philip K. Dick and his novels where... They, they hinge on the idea that, you know, how do we know what's real is real, which is could make you paranoid. You know, if you take a lot of speed, like Philip K. Dick did, maybe you are paranoid, but just because you're paranoid doesn't, doesn't mean you're wrong. <laughs> or they say, what's that saying? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not, they're not really out to get you. Um, but we, we you know these these levers of power that we have all around us and because it's so much more uh exacerbated by the use of social media and the internet which is available 24 7 when i was a kid the tell the tv went off at one in the morning they, they had the <laughs> they, they ran a image of the flag and had the star spangled banner and then there was you couldn't watch tv again until five in the morning um, imagine a world like that. What, what did they do? Um, and here's a couple quotes from, from Bernays later in the book. News reaches the public through the printed word. Books, magazines, letters, posters, circulars, and banners, newspapers. Through pictures, that is photographs and motion pictures. Through the ear, lecture speeches and band music. Radio campaign songs. All these must be employed by the political party if it is to succeed. One method of appeal is merely one method of appeal. And in this age wherein a thousand movements and ideas are competing for public attention, one dare not put all one's eggs into one basket. It is understood that the methods of propaganda can be effective only with the voter who makes up his own mind on the basis of his group prejudices and desires. Now check that out. The voter can make up his own mind on the basis of his group prejudices and desires. And this is what Bernays was, was a genius at, unfortunately, but it, you know, somebody was, that he knew that, you know, humans are kind of herd animals. And so you're looking for your group prejudices and desires, right? And think about where in our current uh, information environment, you see that it's all over the place. All over the place and this is how they try to engineer consent now you've probably seen or heard um that that uh assessment i don't know where it comes from that propaganda works on a third of the people they just buy you know hook line and sinker they buy it but a third of the people another third of the people i should say um they don't necessarily buy it, but they go along to get along, 
right? It's just, you see a lot of that in academia. Oh my God. But there's another third of the people, maybe less than a third, who don't buy it and don't go along with it, right? Um, it's, and who, who knows why that is? It, and I certainly, I would put myself in that last category because um, I've always been kind of nonconformist. You know, I'm, I'll, you know, I think that led, led me to being a philosopher. Like I'm always going, why? <laughs> who said? According to whom? Right? That's your, just your opinion or what? Right? And, and those, but the thing is, you know, you know, if you're like that kind of person, you ask those kinds of questions, you know, you, you start to annoy people after a while. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pr tremendously good at that. I just, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, and here I'm going to, let's go on with, with what Ed Brene says here. He follows with, it is understood that the methods of propaganda can be effective only with the voter. I said that with who makes up his own mind on the basis of his group prejudices and desires where specific uh, allegiances and loyalties exist, as in the case of boss leadership, these loyalties will operate to mollify the free will of the voter. In this close relation between the boss and his constituent lies, of course, the strength of his position in politics. Now, we just saw that. Um, so uh, Kamala Harris um, recently announced that she had the endorsement of the United Auto Workers, which sounds impressive. I mean, that's, a, that's a big voting block, right? Um, but it's propaganda because it wasn't the United Auto Workers who endorsed her. It was their leadership. Right. And because when you see, I saw a poll that um, the actual rank and file of the UAW, and I know this is true because I, I know a lot of UAW, they, none of them are voting for um, Kamala Harris. I think it's like 70% or something, which that even sounds low because, um, because, you know, um, I'm from Detroit and, you know, a lot of my, um, family my father-in-law my late father-in-law worked for worked for uh what's it called, for gm <clears throat> and he bailed on the, the, the well he didn't bail on the union he had to start, stay in the union but he bailed on the union leadership decades ago actually under the clinton administration when robert reich um engineered nafta robert reich that little dwarf of a, of a human being oh he's horrible um, he blocked me on, on X <laughs> the first week was on X. He's just, he's, he's despicable. Um, the engineer of NAFTA, which sent, which destroyed the working class getting a decent wage in this country. You know, there they used to be able to, uh, you know, it, to, uh, make it, make a living wage. And they, they tried under Clinton, they tried to turn the American economy into a, a service economy. Come on. It's too big. An economy to just exist on services. Um, people have to make stuff. Um, yeah, so my father-in-law bailed on on the Democrats and uh, the, the UAW at that time, right? And you know, Detroit is the most blue-collar, at least when I was growing up, it was the most blue-collar town on earth. Everybody in my neighborhood was either a cop, a fireman, or worked in an auto factory. Right, all, all their, you know, all the dads. Um, but you know, this this propaganda machine <laughs> just kind of expected that that uh, that demographic to, to stay in one place and to to not have agency. You know, that's the thing. People, and if you see this, it's really disgusts me. Where. Uh, pollsters or, you know, politicians in particular, they, they seem to assume that people of a demographic all vote and think the same way. As if all women are pro-abortion and are big Kamala Harris fans or all, you know, but it's not true. I mean, like, it's not even close to true, right? But, they, but that's, the way, that's the way the propaganda is presented to us or that all black people are Democrats or and they're all poor or all they're envious, you know, which is horribly racist for one thing. And that they're all, you know, that they're a monolithic uh, body of voting block, which is not true. None of that's true. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, this is, uh, the takeaway is this an, is an important book to read. 
because you can see that the tools in here are laid out. And these are the same tools that they're using now. And my claim is that the way re propaganda really works is they don't aim propaganda at everybody. As I, cause I mentioned earlier, um, the people I know out here in the country, out here in the country, the hunting and fishing people exhibit much more, much clearer evidence of critical thinking and uh, independence of thought than I ever have seen in higher education. So the propaganda and propaganda works on the ed, you know works through the middle managers we can call them like the professors and teachers um, through business um, through and then we saw that through COVID right those are the that's that's where the 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 arms of control worked through those uh, those things and, and it wasn't mom and pop businesses it was big business right big box stores and who's you know who uh stayed open or amazon you know and those kinds of uh mechanisms of control were were used by this invisible government to work into into to try to control um other people now another thing which he doesn't talk about in here but i think it's worth mentioning in uh Matthias de Smet, um, is he, is he Dutch or is he Belgian? I can't remember. Um, but his argument is that the part of the way propaganda works is that first you have to create an environment of a, what he calls free floating anxiety, right? So when people are afraid, you hit them with a message over and over again, and they get the message and they, they conform. And of course, again, like I said earlier, not everybody, you know, about a third or maybe 20% do not go along. But that was, we saw that happen. And, and the thing is, the thing, thing is, uh, this invisible government, whoever it is, and I, and I think we saw during COVID, it was not just in the United States, it was all over the globe. They all started right away with the lockstep slogans, right? Slogans, great, perfect advertising, right? Something short and pithy, you can remember, safe and effective. It's a new normal, right? Build back better. Remember that one? Well, they haven't built anything. It's not back. It's not better. But those things, they all, and I remember uh, when that happened, it was 2020, just before the fall semester in 2020, I went to the campus because they, we had to take a, what do you call it, a PCR test, which I'll never do again because the thing went into my brain. Um, and I saw one of my students and she was just looked shell-shocked. And her name was Hannah. I said, Hannah, what's, what's going on? Said, well, oh, this is really bad, but I guess this is the new normal. I'm like, sweetie, <laughs> don't you ever use that phrase in front of me again. It's not new. It's not normal. Right? It's absolutely not normal. So, uh, but that's how, they, that's how it works, right? You create anxiety and then you hit them with propaganda, which they're susceptible to. And I've written about this before. And if you want to look on my sub stack, I had a series back in, I think, December and January of this 2023 20, and 24 on magic in the imagination. And I, I had some choice quotes from the, the French magician Eliphas Lévy about how magic works. And magic means the control of another another person's will, and that's exactly what was going on in those early. Well, it continues going, but it was especially the, the main tool in evidence during the, those early days of COVID, and with the you know first creating an environment of free floating anxiety to to speak in occult terms to weaken the etheric and astral bodies of people, and then bang, come in with a one-two punch, and then hit them with the slogans, and then you got them. Right, we have to keep everybody safe. So anyway, um, so yes, um, Edward Bernays propaganda, probably one of the most important books of the 20th century, and not in a good way, but it's something we all need to know about. Um, speaking of science, here's I'll just drop another quote from him before we 
Let me, let me break it up. Because he talks about how propaganda works through the arts. And we know that. Look at Hollywood. Look at Netflix. Talk about an agenda, right? Um, then, but also in science. I and mean, this is what we saw happening in the science. And this is 100 years ago, right? As an art, so in science, both pure and applied. Pure science was once guarded and fostered by learned societies and scientific associations. Now pure science finds support and encouragement also in industry. Many of the laboratories in which abstract research is being pursued are now connected with some large corporation, which is quite willing to devote hundreds of thousands of dollars to scientific study for the sake of one golden invention or a discovery which may emerge from it. And now the thing is, right, as we know, speaking of propaganda, we know about um, and this is why uh, so much scientific research is so dubious, and we saw this through COVID, but even if we go back into the 1960s and 70s, where we, we find that scientists were paid off to write articles that looked scholarly, that were, that were discrediting um, fat, or discrediting, you know, and, and so people started, stopped using butter and keep away from eggs and went, then they went for margarine and stuff that's horrible for your system. Um, and, and, and as a result, you know, disease goes way up because they were telling you to eat things that weren't healthy, but they said, but they said, but they had the proof that it was healthy and better for you. Well, it was, it was payola, right? Um, and that's propaganda, and and you and we saw this happen over and over again during the pandemic with scientific journals, you know, or or scientists who resisted the the the, the master narrative were being canceled, and you know that that's not how science works. Um, and here and here he can where he where he goes, and this is what we saw happen. It be, and the agency of social media was a big part of this. And we know that the government went into social media companies and said, hey, you have to limit people's free speech because we don't like what they're saying and that they're not doing what we want to do. And that was right before the winter of death, the winter of disease and death for the unvaccinated. I'm still waiting to, for that winter to come. I guess it must be way in the future. But here's what he says. Propaganda assists in marketing new inventions. Propaganda by repeated, repeatedly interpreting new scientific ideas and inventions to the public has made the public more receptive. Well, scientists said, right? When I was a kid, they had these horrible commercials where like four out of five doctors say, you know, that you should, you know, smoking is not bad for you or whatever, right? Propaganda is accustoming the public to change in progress. No, it's not change in progress. Well, it's change. It's not progress. It depends what you mean by progress. If you mean giving more control to the invisible government, as he calls them, or the archons, as I call them, then yeah, that's progress. But if you're talking about the, the human individual and freedom, no, that's actually the opposite of progress. It's a regression to a state of servitude. And we've, we've heard people describe our current situation as kind of a serfdom, right? That's what the, the desires of the, the, uh, the invisible government would like to go back to a kind of electronic feudal system right? where we're, we're all just serfs on the manor, right? Serfs on the electronic manor, but don't do, let this happen. Um, so anyway, I thought it would be interesting to, to look through this. Well, and one more time, read the opening sentence because it's so important, or two sentences. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. It's an oxymoron right there. <laughs> Democracy it needs a means you need to be controlled. Your your opinion needs to be controlled. Those who manipulate the unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. And things haven't changed. Okay. So we'll see you next time. Try not to be too paranoid. <laughs>